Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Air Force Association's annual Airspace and Cyber Conference and Trade Show, the number one gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world to talk about the service's future, its technology, its budgets, and its strategy. Our coverage here this year is sponsored by Elbit Systems of America, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we're here on the Lockheed Martin stand to talk to Jeff Babion, uh, former uh, chief of the F-35 program for Lockheed Martin, and now the man who has the coolest job in the entire aerospace and defense industry, the head of Skunk Works, the vice president and general manager of advanced development projects. How cool is this, Jeff, on the 75th anniversary of the, of the, the most innovative technology, technology company in the sector? Vago, it is super exciting. Uh, you know, when you see someone win the Super Bowl, they come up to the, the winning quarterback, Tom Brady, where are you going? I'm going to Disneyland. Jeff Babione, you just won the Super Bowl, I'm going to the Skunk Works. It's just fantastic. Leading such an innovative team, I mean the people that are there, the things that we're working on, shaping what the next 75 years of aviation history, I mean it is the best job in aviation. Um, I mean it's, you know, and I think that people, you know, you were ta we were talking about this and I think, you know, as, as, a, as I'm going to just say, an un unmitigated fan of the organization and some of the just the legendary people who've worked there over the years, whether it was Ben Rich or uh, Frank Capuccio, uh, now you, people will be talking about you, Rob Weiss, you know, I mean, all of these giants, and then all of the other people who are just the engineers who folks tend not to, you know, to see and talk uh, as yeah, that's much about. Where the real work's getting done. And it is, it is, really. I mean, you're just an overhead. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, um, you know, C-130, U-2, SR-71, the P-80, the F-22, the Joint Strike Fighter, the Sea Shadow, um, air, space, subsea, seafloor, um, land. You know, talk to us a little bit, you know, as you look across that portfolio. What do you, what, what does stand out as you as somebody who's an engineer, who's been in this business, who's an airplane guy at heart? What are some of the things that, you know, you think were sort of the high watermarks of, of a company that has just so many high watermarks? Yeah, I think you did a great job of offering just how broad the portfolio is. And, and while it's probably still the core about things that fly with wings, it's really much broader than that. So you think about everything from hypersonics, and that could be a weapon, that could be an airplane, it could be something else. Things that go a mile a second or faster. And really speed is turning out to be that new edge. It's like the new LO. How do I go fast? How do I communicate fast? How do I get... Uh, weapons on target faster, all that speed aspect. You see that across the portfolio from our hypersonics works to multi-domain command and control. How do I gather information across all these platforms, whether it be in the space or be air to air, surface to ground, undersea? How do I bring all that information to the men and women that are going to use that information to provide an effect? We're doing that. We're in compact fusion. How do you make a fusion reactor so small that you can put it into an airplane, put it in your neighborhood? I mean, that's incredible advancements in technology that we're doing right now in the Skunk Works. Uh, that's extraordinary. And I forgot to mention, of course, Kelly Johnson. I was just talking about the Skunk Works chiefs that I've met. You know, I didn't have the honor of meeting Kelly, uh, uh, Kelly Johnson, but, uh, um, you know, obviously one of the all-time greats um, in aeronautics uh, and, and actually engineering history. Um, you're also privy, uh, although not yet entirely, right, because of the extreme classification of the things that you guys worked on that were- yeah, Many were, things we do are highly classified. Uh, yeah, yeah we've, we've gathered that, uh, strangely enough, Jeff. Uh, but, we you know, when you look at the things that didn't work, right, and everybody's always like, wow, how cool is that? Yeah. But, you know, as you look at some of those things, what are the lessons you carry away from looking at some of those systems? You know, Frank used to say, hey, you know what, it's always good to know the past, you can look at it, something may have been way ahead of its time, but then, you know, has another applicability somewhere. As you look at that, you know, what do you see that even from the failures that the company had or the things that didn't quite get there, you know, what, what are, you know, A, are they as cool as everybody thinks they are, which I suspect the answer is yes, but B, what are the lessons that they teach you about stuff that you're doing even today? Yeah, Vago, that's a great point. I think sometime the best lesson is a failure. And now I think we're seeing the benefit of some early, we won't even call them failures. I think you were pushing the limit, particularly in hypersonics. So HTV, which was a fantastic program, flying at Mach 20. Um, many would say that was a failure because the glider burned up. But we learned so much from that that now we are applying that to the next generation of hypersonics. And so we've got four different 
portfolios of hypersonic weapons that were using much of the same technology, but now learning from those mistakes. Um, I think we also learn how to do things differently. We go one way and we recognize, hey, technically, that was a good idea, but we can't probably do that in an operational or production environment. So I think learning from those mistakes is actually a hallmark of what the Skunk Works do. I and mean, it's going, you may hear this term fail fast. Uh, I mean, I think it means different things to different people, but what the Skunks are willing to do is take a chance and find out what doesn't work. In only that way do you find out what does work. And that's how you move quickly from a concept to something fielded. It's really about speed to market. Well, so you mentioned speed, right? One of the most extraordinary things when you look at um, the history of the company, the P80, the U2, even the uh, C130, uh, F117 certainly, were done in extraordinarily short cycles. I mean, you went from like idea of this powered high altitude glider to delivered articles in like two years, yeah. right? Um, F117, uh, the P80 was how long? 143 days. 143 days for the Contract first- Contract signature to the first flying prototype delivered. 143 days. I mean, you know, we're arguing over a line over a contract for like eight <laughs> years, that, right? right. Um, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about how you guys are, are, are being able to channel that at its, and, and what can the entire sector learn from those experiences? You have the customer, you have Dr. Roper saying, hey, yeah, speed is ideas. the most, most important, uh, you know, how, how, you know, speed is the most important thing. All, all due respect to Dr. Roper, Dr. Carter, Ash Carter would say the same, their first interview when he was ATNL was like the number one thing is speed. Right. Everything comes from speed, we have to increase speed. Talk to us about what some of the lessons are looking at the history, the portfolio of the company, and what lessons there are for the entire industry and even the government. Yeah, so I think Kelly was the one that really founded that different way of doing business, and, and many of you know about Kelly's 14 rules, right? And in the modern day, some of those rules just really aren't viable because of various laws. But if you, if you break them down, there's a couple of key tenets. Uh, first, about the size of the team. Keep things small, both on the contractor side and on the customer side. Why is that important? The small size improves communication, and streams line decision making, and you go from problem to solution to implementation much faster. He empowered his team. So when I say empowered, that means you have the ability to make a decision and you have the resources to back the decision. You have the people, you have the funding, you have the material. So you give small teams the resources they need and they can move quickly. And that, that also means reducing bureaucracy. Sometimes I'm amazed about the number of reports and documents that we have to generate that for the most part don't do anything to actually make something fly or have an effect. And so he did everything he could to reduce the bureaucracy. And you look at the way we do many of our contracts and the way we work with our customer, small teams, reducing bureaucracy, increases speed. At the core, that's what we're trying to do is move quickly through the process with a minimum amount of bureaucracy. Uh, yeah, well, um, you're an F-22 veteran as well. Yeah. Uh, I note for our viewers that uh, you know it's been estimated that 25% of the F-22's aggregate cost was in reporting requirements. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so I can neither confirm or deny. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Of course, none of those you know those if those, those reports were, fell on an adversary, they would they would really have quite an impact. Um, Let's talk about today. You mentioned multi-domain battle. Um, one of the things that we, um, you know, obviously a key priority of the chief is, you know, not just multi-domain battle, but hey, we have to re-gear as a service to uh, great power competition. You know, to be, that we're going to now increasingly have to fight into a target, fight back from a target, worth our bases contested, very much a Cold right. War kind of scenario, uh, and, and, and certainly something that the Air Force throughout its history has been comfortable with or familiar with from World War I all the way to the present. As you look at what the requirements are, you know, we talked to uh, General Miller, the new commander on her, on her 10th day on the job at, at Air, Air Mobility yeah. Command, and we asked her, hey, you know, what does the, tra the, the, the transport of the future look like? And she said, it's got to be something to operate in contested airspace, and you guys have a very, very we cool do. model over there. But talk to us a little bit about, you know, there's so much you guys have to offer. When you hear these messages, what are some of the things that you're bringing to bear to try to scratch some of those itches that, that may not necessarily all be black, right? Because you guys have also operated in the white world. Sure, I think the certainly the area of contested environments is 
is much larger. You, you think maybe this area wasn't a contested, basically with some of the new IADs, basically any airspace becomes a contested or denied environment. And so this idea that you're gonna just kick the door down in, kick the door in and everything's gonna flow in, I think those days are gone. So you have to look across the whole portfolio. Start with hypersonics. Let's stand off and apply effect over a great distance at very high speeds. Again, more than a mile a second. Then you're gonna need fifth generation platforms, the F-35, the F-22, to be in that space. But in order to stay in that space, they're gonna need fuel. So now you need a low observable fueling platform. Lockheed, with its great experience in LO technology, we have ideas on how we might be able to do that. You're also are going to need a command and control node in that same environment. Maybe it's uh, using electronic warfare effects coming up. Maybe it's just a communication node. Maybe it has strike capability. Maybe it has all those capabilities. So it's really a system of system, multiple platforms, put in this multi-domain command and control that will be the fight of the future. And what we're doing at Skunk Works is not only looking at each one of those, from the hypersonic weapons to the low observable refueling uh, system, but how do you connect all those nodes together? Uh, you may have seen some of these um, diagrams to lightning bolts between various platforms. We know what those lightning bolts are now, and we know how to aggregate that information, and provide that to the command and control officers so they can make decisions real time using artificial intelligence, machine and machine learning. I mean, you're starting to see this tremendous acceleration to decision making that we will apply against all these athletes. It's very, very exciting. Oh, I, I, I can uh, I can only imagine, and if uh, any time we want to be taken in the Spunk Works, we'd be we'd be happy to do that. Uh, uh, talk to us. Um, you know, you, you guys um, have have always had a, a certain commercial component to it. Always supported Lockheed uh, aviation programs. Um, you know, there was a little bit of your fingerprinting on the L ten eleven program sure. as, as well, uh, which had novel ducting and aerodynamics that went with the airplane. Um, you're now involved in the AS2, the Arion program, to develop a supersonic business jet uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Bass uh, as well as uh, Dr. Tracy on aerodynamics, who's Tom working Weiss it. Tom is now the CEO of Arion. Uh, Tom, Tom Weiss is the is the CEO. That's right. Uh, good good shout out to another another airplane guy from uh, from Northrop, uh, certainly. Um, Talk to us a little bit about this program, all of the things that you're doing, because the key is not just getting a supersonic business yet, but getting something that is actually usable, affordable. Um, it opens potentially some um, military work for you because they're for high-speed delivery or VIP delivery or, or even for reconnaissance and a couple of other purposes. Talk to us a little bit about that program, why it's important to the company, and some of the other things you're doing, for example, on mitigation of sonic booms, which yeah. has always been an issue over a populated area. Yeah, so we're actually doing quite a bit of work in commercial supersonic flight. Uh, you mentioned Arion, so we're supporting Arion with uh, engineering support for their configuration design, propulsion integration, air vehicle integration, really the core things that Lockheed Martin particularly Lockheed Martin Skunk Works is very good at. And I'm actually very excited with the configuration that we've come up with. There's a lot of challenges, but we know how to make an airplane go Mach 1.4, we do that all the time. Now, how do we tailor the fuel consumption to make sure that it has the proper range at the proper uh, price point for that? And, you know, Ariane's got a lot of really talented engineers, some fantastic aerodynamicists, uh, just a really good team to work with. So we're very excited uh, to support them in their effort around uh, their AS2. And then we talk about commercial um, Supersonic. So we're working with NASA on X-59. This is how do you reduce the impact that the sonic boom has when you're going Mach 1.4. Think about how do you make it just sound like ambient. Think about a car door slamming. No louder than that. The goal here is if we can do that, we think then we could change the laws in the U.S. about flying supersonic over land. Think about how quick you'd be able to move from the east coast to the west coast or even across uh, to another continent. It's very, very exciting, and uh, we should be flying that plane in, in less than two years. So we do X planes at, at ADP, and we got a couple under our belt right now. Um, the, the, uh, and check out our interviews. We did a whole series of interviews. Uh, um, uh, when the AS2 was announced at the National uh, at the National Press Club, and I can say, you know, as somebody who flew on the Concorde once and yep. made it to Mach 2 at 55,000 feet, and you cross the Atlantic in about three hours, it's just completely game-changing. And John Weston, who was the former CEO of uh, British Aerospace, 
uh, BAE Systems, started his career as an apprentice, Cambridge apprentice on the Concord line in Fulton. Wow. Yeah. And he said that it was the first time in history that mankind has actually taken a step back from an uh, aeronautical advance. And I think that was a really powerful statement uh, when the airplane went out of service in 2003. Um, one of the things that Skunk Works has also done is reimagine sort of the art of the manufacturing possible, yeah. right? So, I mean, everybody has a tendency of thinking on technology, but for example, the technology and the build with the way you guys developed and did the U2 was a marvel of efficiency mm -hmm. using existing parts and capabilities wherever you could, F-117, you know, I inside the- it today and I'm amazed about how clean and simple the U2 design is. You can separate the airplane in half to get at the engine. Yeah. Just tremendous, back to that simplicity point. Great functionality just very simple, wins the day. It's been around for 60 years. Well, and, and on F-117, everything in the skin, right, the skin and, out, and the systems and everything were novel and different, but almost everything in it was a regular Air Force inventory airplane. It was nothing very special. Reuse. Reuse. So what are some of the lessons and the approaches we need to take at a time when folks are saying, you know, everybody's doing a heroic job trying to get the F-30, it's not like you were scarred at all by this experience, to reduce the F-35 cost, but then there are folks who say, hey, look, if we can get F-35 performance for $20 million, we can actually fill out that force structure a lot faster, and I know you guys have been thinking about this problem. You know, what, what are some keys to doing that? You know, we're on the manufacturing side, how do we need to change how it is we think about what the thing is, and even its life expectancy? Should they be designed to survive for 55 years? Or is it much better to say, you know what? I'm going to give it to you for $15 million. It will live eight years, and you'll junk it, and you're going to buy a new one, and I will have a total refresh for you at that point. Yeah, great points. I think the hallmark of ADP has been not only in its just the technology and design, but low cost. So you think JASM. Uh, we're able to reduce the number of parts in the JASM like by 10x. That's what made that weapon actually affordable. Uh, as we go forward, we build these prototypes very fast. How can we do that? We use low cost tooling that we build in house and enables us to adapt to many different shapes at a low cost. So you're right, we've got to figure out a way to reduce the airframe costs from the very beginning. Advanced, managing, advanced, uh, advanced manufacturing techniques. We call it um, deterministic assembly. So what if it went together much like a rector set, then having to drill very specific holes, mechanics doing a lot of that, we can either take the fasteners out altogether or make it very simple to put together. We're doing that on the latest platforms that we're putting out. Your other point about uh, mission systems and how long they should last is something I've been talking about since I ran F-22. I think it doesn't make any sense to design something, particularly an avionics system, for 8,000 hour and 20 plus years. You don't have anything in your house that is that old that long that is electronic. The, the industry moves way too fast. So now what we're looking at is how do I go to low cost computing, commercial computing kinds of cards that last two to 3,000 hours, but the software doesn't care what hardware's underneath. So when it runs, it, it, it's two or three years, we just replace it with something new that's probably cheaper and faster. Uh, we pioneered open system architecture at ADP. It's basically the standard now for all new weapon systems. What does that enable you to do? It removes the software's dependency on the hardware, so you can change hardware easily as the speed upgrades, as the cost gets reduced. That allows those applications to not care what hardware. So we are right in the middle of that, and I think industry can show our government how, how we can reduce costs in long-term sustainment and modernization of the systems by going to some more of these commercial models. But do you think that even from an airframe perspective, hey look, let's design this in a different sort of a way so it has you know, X hundreds or X thousands of hours, but hey, you don't de-check it, you don't take it to a depot, it's all composite, we break it down, and it's easier for us to give you that new you know, almost like a scaled composites yeah. model. You know, Bert Rutan used to talk about that a little bit. Versus right. maintainable. Yeah, that's a different. That's a different balance, and I think uh, there's probably more work to be done with that. I think there's value in having an airframe that lasts 20, 30, 40 years, at least the, the model that we're doing now. And then you have avionics and subsystems that you replace much faster. If you flip the paradigm, and, and basically almost you're saying that part of the structure is a trivial or replaceable. Mm -hmm. um, that's also a different business model. I think you just have to change what you think the requirements for the systems are. Um, I think when we start fielding systems faster, then you would have confidence that you could attrit 
systems faster, right? Because I think what happens now is you, it takes so long to get a weapon system in place that you want to stay there as long as possible, get as much as you can out of it. That's why it's so hard to kill uh, airplane systems. It takes so long. I think if you get into the point where they get into the field faster, then you can talk about getting them out and reducing, let's only design them for 2,000 hours, only design them for 4,000 hours. And maybe there's a, a mix. We're doing some, what we call, attritable systems. So how do you send an airplane in there that you know is not coming back, but it's so low cost that it doesn't matter. It, it's the only thing that could survive, and you don't risk a person's life in getting in there. So it's a, an interesting part of the market. Um, and two, uh, two questions, because I know we're, we're going a little bit long and you've got a busy day. Um, you know, from your experience from F-35, is the better approach for the future to not try to do one airplane that does all of these things, but actually to do much more targeted airplanes to a specific problem by marshalling model-based design, you know, all of the techniques that you've been talking about, to scratch that specific itch instead of saying, you know what, we're going to have a dozen nations coming in to do an air, I mean, the unprecedented nature of the airplane, I mean, sorry, it's just, without sounding, you know, still going to be tough with you guys on costs and availability and everything else, that's not your problem anymore. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was just such an ambitious requirement. You know, are we better off just looking at much more targeted sort of systems in the future that we can, you know, low cost, there's low cost, I remember that a little bit, but is very targeted for the application to potentially make life easier for everybody? Yeah, I think as usual, there's probably not one size fits all. F-35 and the, I guess, the industrial, industrial, and international tapestry we put together for that program had a tremendous value. It reduced the cost to everybody, but it came with a certain level of bureaucracy and complexity that, as everyone who met, that's a difficult part of the program. Um, I think for specific customers, targeting exactly what they need in a much more rapid environment long term will probably be more sustainable. Uh, will we ever do another F-35 that will be multi-country, multi-service? Who knows? Um, but I think what we do know is we learned a lot from that program and we're taking that forward on everything that we do forward. Uh, one of the things that we're working on is what is the next generation aerodynamics? What replaces the F-22? What replaces the F-35? And we learned a lot from both of those programs and now we can leverage that going forward. So that's actually one of the very exciting parts of the job is looking out there 10, 20 years, what are we going to be flying? What is 6th gen look like in the future? And what does it look like in the future? You know, it's, it's many of the attributes that you see now. I mean, basically LO is a given, but now we have to operate in a multi-spectral domain, so infrared and other ways to sense our location. Uh, I think maybe maneuverability might be less important and more about bringing the proper weapons, so think about fifth and sixth gen weapons going forward. It's not, uh, it's an information node, it's a sensing mode, it's a shooter, much like fifth gen already is, but being able to extend its range, its duration on target, it's, it's a broad set of capabilities that may not be housed in just one, one platform. Um, yeah, no pressure on you at all on that, by the way, not that it would fall under your purview, but I, I believe you are, are at the beginning of a long career. Um, after a lot of experience that you've already gained, by the way. Last question, um, on the human skills part of it. Um, there is this concern, you know, China now has this massive 20% national investment right. program. Um, the quality of the engineering is very, very good uh, because, uh, you know, bright Chinese kids go to Caltech and they go to MIT and right. they go to Cambridge uh, and the world's other great universities and then they apprentice for American cutting edge companies. Then they go run the division in China right. from those companies and then they end up at Comac and everybody wonders, oh my God, you know, would they be able to develop this kind of a capability? And the short answer to that is yes, right? So that reduces our relative advantage, whereas in the Soviet, you know, against the Soviet Union, no Soviet engineers were coming and studying at Caltech, apprenticing at Boeing, and then and then going World back War home. II, we brought Germans over here to accelerate our programs, uh, right? Uh, absolutely true, right. If we had not had those guys come over here, we wouldn't have been making it to the moon any more than, uh, so, so talk to us a little bit about, you know, you guys need the absolute best engineer. The industry does, but you guys, Phantom Works, Bicycle Works at Raytheon, all need the absolute best talent. Our, are, is the nation producing the kind of talent that we need given the demand for engineers is just going off the charts right. in terms of the sophistication of, I mean, we need people. Are we generating the people who can be cleared and actually work for us as opposed to they're very, very good guys, but they're going to go back to India, China, Japan, or anywhere else? Well, Bago, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, really what separates 
ADP, the Skunk Works, from all those others you talked about is the people. I mean, from the second you walk in the door, you just feel a different culture, a culture that says, yes, I can do this. It doesn't matter how hard, but that takes math, science, engineers, and all disciplines, from contracts to human resources, everybody is part of the team. But we are struggling to refill that pipeline. I'm growing at a tremendous rate. At the same time, Northrop and Boeing and everybody else is. And so we're going to the universities and scooping up all the engineers we can. What I've really been excited about is the engineers that are coming in are really much more generalist than I was coming out. Their ability to adapt and use the current technology, their learning is accelerated much faster. So I'm actually very optimistic about the talent that we're getting in. Whether or not we could do better, I'm absolutely sure we could. You know, Lockheed Martin spends a lot of time in STEM investments, and I, I think I'm personally going to spend a lot of time is down at the middle school level. That's when we need to capture the men and women that we want to become engineers in science, and particularly um, for women. It's 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 still un still amazing to me that we have so few women engineers. They're half the population, but they're less than one third of the workforce. So what can we do to improve their representation in engineering? And so we're doing a lot of that, but I'm very, very excited about the students I'm seeing. Uh, it's great to see their enthusiasm, and maybe they don't know how to build an next plane, but I turn it over and kind of say, this is kind of how it's done. It's amazing what they come up with. Jeff Babion, Vice President and General Manager of Lockheed Martin's Advanced Development Projects, the legendary Skunk Works on its 75th anniversary. Thank you so much for all this time, man. I really, really appreciate it. Best of luck to you. Uh, just leading, I mean, as I said, you, you're, you, are, you have the, the best job, job in the industry. Great, thank you, Vagam, appreciate it.